Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Constellation Crew. We have Melanie, Caleb, and Greg here on screen with us, and we have Nicolette helping out in the chat. If you have any questions during the presentation, put them in the chat and we'll see them there. Um, but first, before we get into the two constellations that we're going to explore today, we have this mystery image, and Melanie's going to help us understand what it is. But before she does, I want you to try to guess what it is. If you know what this image is, put your answer in the chat. And I think Caleb and Greg, you don't know what this is either. So what do you think that this is? Um, it kind of looks like a color spectrum of stars is what I would assume. But that's, that's my guess. All right, uh, I'll say that it is a star and it does look like there's lots of different colors here. Um, any idea as to what star this might be? The sun, maybe? So this is a real, these are real pictures here, right, Mel? Yep. This Let's isn't one that. picture, this is multiple pictures put together, right? So we have multiple uh, pictures put together, um, kind of lining out here, um, the same star over the course of time. Is it the North Star? It is not the North Star, it's brighter than that. Because the North Star is not is the brightest it, uh, star in the night sky, right? That's true. Is it, a, is it serious? It is serious. Yep, the brightest star in the night sky. It's a part of one of the constellations that we're exploring this evening, uh, Canis Major. And we're also going to be looking at Canis Minor today, too. Melanie, did you have any other words for this uh, or descriptions for this picture here? Yeah, I was going to ask, do you think it's actually changing color or not? Any guesses? All right, so, no. yeah, this is a, this is a picture no. of a star. Is so. it actually changing these colors? It's not taken with any filters or anything like that. It's just taken oh. with a regular camera with mm. our atmosphere and the way. And it looks like this. Oh. I don't expect that. I saw somewhere that it appears to twinkle so much that sometimes it gets reported as a UFO because it's so bright and twinkly. Yeah, and sometimes it looks apparently green in the sky. Sometimes it looks purple or pink. So it looks all these different colors. And it twinkles, like Melanie said, these different colors. So if you take a photo of it at one point in time, you can see one of those colors shining through because of the interaction with, of the light with our atmosphere. So the star isn't actually changing its color or anything like that. The starlight that's passing through our atmosphere gets bent a little bit. It's refracted and it shows up as these different colors. I think it's that's beautiful. Really cool. yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. All right. So where is the star in the sky? Where is Sirius? Well, we're going to see. Um, but first, let's go back to our sky tonight. We're going to look south here in our simulation. And we're going to do a recap of all the constellations that we've explored so far because they make up something called the winter hexagon. And we first started with the constellation Orion the Hunter because Orion helps us find a lot of things in the sky. And he's really easy to find, especially with his three stars here in a row that make up his belt. And if you follow them upward, you can get to this other constellation. What constellation is this crew? Taurus. Yep, we have Taurus the Bull right here. And then up above Taurus here in the sky is another constellation that we've explored. What constellation is that? Auriga. Auriga, yep. And then off to the east here is this rectangle group of stars here. What constellation is that? The twins, remember? Gemini. Gemini, yep. All right, so then we're going to go down this way to get to that bright star there. That is Sirius right here. And that's the one that we saw all those colors from. So this is a real image or multiple images of the sky. Um, really looking at this bright star here called Sirius. Now Sirius makes up one of the constellations that we're going to explore this evening, Canis Major. 
the dog. And you can find Canis Major using Orion's belt, right, Mel? Yep. So just head down our towards the horizon. Look for that bright star, Sirius. All right, so you can use Orion's belt, go down towards the horizon, and it leads you to the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, which makes up part of the constellation Canis Major here, the dog. But there's not just one dog in the sky, there are two dogs in the sky. And a part of the winter hexagon is this bright star here called Procyon. And Procyon and this other star here make up this whole puppy, Canis Minor. So they got a whole puppy out of those two stars. We're gonna explore Procyon in a little bit, but let's first look more at Sirius here. Because Sirius, even though it looks like one star to our eyes in the sky, it's actually two, right Mel? Yeah, so Sirius is appropriately named the dog star because it's one of those constellations that actually looks like what it's named after, which I always appreciate. It makes it a little easier to find. Um, so you might notice um, what direction we're facing and that's south. And you're thinking kind of how Dana mentioned, okay, it's the brightest star in the night sky. I thought that was supposed to be the North Star, um, but obviously we're not facing north. So Dr. K used to always say, if somebody tells you, if you're ever lost to follow the brightest star in the sky and that will lead you north, that is not true. They're trying to get you in trouble. Uh, so <laughs> that's something to remember. <laughs> and we also say it's the brightest star in the night sky, because I don't know about you, I take my trivia very seriously and that one has burned me in the past because of course the brightest star in the sky is the sun. So if somebody asks you that, they might be trying to trick you. So think twice. Uh, but yeah, as Dana said, this is not only the brightest star in the night sky, but there's actually two stars here. And as we learned uh, in the last few weeks, we've talked about them a few times, they are called binary stars, uh, meaning that these two stars are orbiting around one another. And so we call them Procyon or Sirius A and B, which makes sense, or with A being our bigger star. Um, it's a main sequence and the Sirius B is a white dwarf star. You can see them kind of interact. They're gravitationally kind of stuck together, making this little circle. And Sirius A is pretty similar to our sun in terms of size and mass. So it's about twice the mass of the sun and about twice the radius of the sun. So they're pretty comparable compared to some of the really big stars and some of the really little stars. But it's actually 25 times brighter than our sun. And you might think, well, how is that possible if they're pretty comparable in size? And that's just because this one star is so much hotter than our sun that it makes it appear significantly brighter. And I thought that was really interesting that they were really similar in size, but way, way brighter than our sun. Yeah, absolutely. And they're kind of orbiting this empty space here, the center of mass of the system here um, in orbit around each other basically i like that you can see the slingshot effect in this yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's pretty cool we were going through time um 10 years every second in that simulation so time was sped up a lot okay mm -hmm. all right so we were looking at sirius here and the um companion to sirius sirius b orbiting around each other and sirius helps make up this winter hexagon which is only going to be in our sky a little bit um, for a little bit longer because winter is coming to an end. We're moving into spring and we have seasonal constellations. Um, so if you want to check out the winter hexagon, uh, really now is the time. Right after sunset, look towards the southern sky and try to find Orion first. And from it, you can find everything else. Well, let's go up from um, Sirius here to Procyon. Remember Procyon and the other star here, this kind of line constellation in the sky is a whole nother constellation called Canis Minor, the little dog. And Procyon has a companion too, right? Yeah, so I thought it was kind of cute because they call them pups. So it's like the pup within the puppy constellation. I thought that was kind of cute. Cool. Um, and we're gonna come back to that actually in just a little bit. Uh, first, we're gonna learn more about um, what's in Canis Major, uh, Canis Major, excuse me, uh, with Greg. Um, because in this area of the sky in the south, right above Orion, right above Canis Major, is this band of light. 
No, if you know what this band of light is, go ahead and put it in the chat. We have this band of light here. It kind of looks like spilt milk or a whole bunch of bright objects. It's different from just like the points of light that we see here as stars. So what is this band of light crew? Home. Oh, okay. Home. That's the that's yeah. Milky Way. <laughs> yeah, it's the Milky, Milky Way. Way. It's the Milky Way, our galaxy. Uh, really, in fact, every star that you see here is a part of our Milky Way galaxy. We just see the closer ones or the brighter ones in our sky as points of light that we make our constellations out of. But that band of light is filled with stars in our galaxy too. And in our simulation here, we're going to fly out of it and see what it looks like or what it might look like from the outside. And Greg's going to teach us all about or let us know all about galaxies here. So let's start the simulation here. Keep an eye on this band here because we're going to fly out of our galaxy. And Katie Starr says that her five-year-old said that the band was the Milky Way. So great job um, to everyone who knew that that was the Milky Way. And here it is, but this isn't a real picture, right, Greg? Correct, yeah, no. Um, what, what we see in the sky is we see that band of, of light. Um, and that's because our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. So when we talk about galaxies, really, we're just talking about groups of gas, dust, and stars that are bound together by their gravity, right? So by the gravity of the, the center. Um, and so when we look at, you know, when we look at the night sky, and if you're lucky enough to ever see that band in the night sky, really, you're just seeing part of the Milky Way. Um, and because our Milky Way is the type of galaxy called a spiral, it's that flat disk and you're seeing part of that flat disk. Yeah, that we just flew through here in the simulation. <laughs> yep. Um, and interestingly enough, spiral galaxies um, are the most abundant. So out of all of the observable galaxies in, in the sky, um, about two thirds of them are spiral galaxies. And spiral galaxies can actually be further broken up into regular spirals and barred spirals. Okay, so we're going to see some pictures of regular versus barred spiral galaxies. Um, but you said that there's other galaxies, other types of galaxies. We don't just have the Milky Way here. So in the simulation, every single smudge here that it just got turned on, all the smudges here, those are not stars. Those are whole other galaxies filled with millions, billions, and trillions of stars of their own. And there's billions of galaxies out in our universe that we can explore. And they come in different shapes and sizes, like Greg said, we gotta categorize them. Yeah, and so um, the way we categorize them, right? So we talked about spirals, we talked about how there's kind of two different types. Um, then there are two other types of galaxies as well. There's an elliptical galaxy, and there's an irregular galaxy. And here and I think just a couple seconds, we're, we're going to see um, some of the, the pictures of those um, different types of galaxies. But what I think is really cool is when you look at the smudges, you can kind of tell this for especially a few of them. You can you can really kind of tell um, the shape of them even this far away. So right here, this is what we call a barred spiral. Um, and this is actually what astronomers think that the Milky Way galaxy is. So the Milky Way is a, it's a barred spiral. Um, and it's got that bar of, of uh, that concentration of stars right in the center. So right in what we call the, the nuclear bulge. Got that bar of stars. And that's generally where the spiral arms of a barred spiral. Yeah, okay, so these are the spiral arms here. There's the barred feature. Here's another smart spiral arm. So why don't we have a picture of our own galaxy? Why do we just have a uh, simulation or artist rendition or pretend pictures of it? I don't think we have a selfie stick that's long enough to uh, take a picture of the Milky Way. <laughs> that's a new one. <laughs> Alec Neal one says that stick. this one is his favorite galaxy. Thanks, Alec. Yeah. All right. So we don't have a picture of our own Milky Way because it's too big. We haven't gone outside of it yet. 
but we are pretty sure that it is looks like excuse me doesn't look like this this is which is another spiral galaxy right but this one is what an, a normal or what do they call ordinary yeah ordinary yeah, it's spiral. an ordinary spiral yep and um the majority of, of spiral galaxies actually are not ordinary which i think is kind of funny right the ordinary ones are actually only about 25 percent of all spiral galaxies so only about a quarter of all of the spiral galaxies we see don't have a bar and it's just kind of funny that that's what we call the ordinary ones yeah and you said that there's more than um just the spiral galaxies and the two types of spiral galaxies, like this galaxy right here. Yep. So we call those types of galaxies elliptical galaxies. So they don't have the, the spiral arms coming off of them. Um, they don't have a very clear kind of nuclear bulge with the spirals, right? Now they get brighter toward the center and then dimmer toward the outside, just like a, a spiral galaxy does. But, but elliptical galaxies are just shaped um, as either you know circular or more ellipses. Typically, elliptical galaxies, um, older stars, they're just formed of much older stars, red giants. And astronomers believe that um, the elliptical galaxies are no longer actively creating new stars. Are yeah. they still kind of two-dimensional and flat, or are they more three-dimensional, like spherical? So from and, and Dana, you'll, you'll probably have to correct me, but from what I understand, I'm pretty sure they're not as flat as a spiral, um, but they still are in a, in a specific plane. A little bit squished? Okay. Yeah. I think, I think they are mostly spherical, oh, but go. they do have, um, you know, you can see that from a different angle and because of the dimensions of it, it can appear in different ways. Uh, but it's hard to tell sometimes. Space is three-dimensional. Um, and these galaxies, like the elliptical ones, are millions of light years away. And so it is quite difficult to really um, explore them in detail. But we were doing it. We got this really great picture right here. Um, there's some other galaxies in this picture too, right? So here's another spiral. It's a really funky spiral here. But these are not uh, other galaxies, right? The ones with spikes, remember what those are, crew? So what are these objects? Stars. Yeah, those are stars. All the, all the objects here in this picture are, with spikes anyway, are stars. Those are called diffraction spikes. That's just a result of the light coming in through a telescope and getting affected by the telescopes, like the actual components of the telescope. Because um, this is like a point of light. It's really affected by certain things like arms that hold a telescope's mirror in place. All right, we got more galaxies. So the last type um, are called the irregular galaxies. That's what you can see on your, your screen in the upper right hand corner there. and. We call anything that's not a spiral or an elliptical galaxy irregular. So pretty much, is it spiral? No. Is it elliptical? No. Okay, then we just call it irregular. And irregular galaxies are actually the oldest types of galaxies that we can see, uh, including the oldest observable galaxy, which is GNZ11. But it's an example of, of a really old irregular galaxy that's 32 billion light years away. But so two different reasons for the, the regular shapes. Caleb, are you going to ask Excuse a question? Me. Yeah, did you, did you say it was 32 billion years yep. old? Light years away, yeah. Light years oh, away. Oh, sorry. Oh, yep. my bad. Um, so there's kind of, you know, the one idea is that irregular galaxies, because most of them that we see are, are really old, that they just haven't had the time to get into a specific shape. So either a spiral or, or an elliptical. Um, and then the other, the other kind of idea, right, is that these irregular galaxies are a result of the interactions of multiple galaxies, right, which 
kind of leads us into that other picture right there. So that right there is a picture of two galaxies that are interacting with one another. And um, they can, some, you know, sometimes it can form an elliptical galaxy, sometimes depending on the size of one versus the other, sometimes it can form a, a spiral galaxy, and then sometimes it could result in, in an irregular galaxy as well. It's like a binary galaxy system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, speak, theoretically speaking, we know that our own galaxies on crash course with that uh, the Andromeda galaxy. So our galaxy could become a, 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 a regular galaxy, possibly. Um, right. Models show that it'll just, in essence, become one big spiral galaxy. It might become um, elliptical. But it could also become, yep, it also could become an elliptical galaxy as well. Yeah, so uh, um, Katie says that her five-year-old uh, is asking what causes the different shapes of these galaxies. And you went over uh, the regular galaxies, especially the two that were interacting. We call those the mice galaxies because they look like mice playing, I guess. And then um, we have the spiral galaxies and the elliptical galaxies, which are really large. The elliptical ones have trillions of stars in them. They're very massive. Um, and it's probably, they're probably created by two spiral galaxies combining and aging over time to create that shape. Um, right. So we know that we have the Milky Way in, out in space, but we also know that there are trillions of other galaxies, some closer than others. And one of the nearby galaxies to us, the closest spiral galaxy to us, the Andromeda galaxy, is headed towards us, right, Greg? Yep. Yeah, so the Andromeda galaxy is the, um, the closest, like you said, the closest spiral galaxy to us. Um, and it is it heading to a crash course, the Milky Way, that should happen in the next couple billion years. Not not in our lifetime, so, so nothing to worry about there. But um, interestingly enough, though, that's not the old, that's not even the, the closest total galaxy to us, right? So the local group is, is what we call this um, picture right here that shows all of the galaxies within a 10 million light year radius. To, to Milky Way. We call that the local group. And while the Andromeda galaxy might be the closest spiral to us, it might be the galaxy that is closest to us that most people are familiar with, there's actually a galaxy that's only 25,000 light years away from us, right? And what's that? So the, the 25,000 light years, just to put that in perspective, it's closer than this galaxy here, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. So it's yep. not even shown in this in, in this graphic. It's much closer, uh, but it's a dwarf galaxy. And let's see what that might look like um, out in space around our Milky Way. And it's complex. So here's a uh, artist's rendering of our Milky Way galaxy, what we think our galaxy looks like. It is a barred spiral, we think. Um, it has all these spiral arms, but there's these strings of stars going around and through and up and around over here, kind of compact here in the depiction here. And that's a dwarf galaxy that is in the constellation we're talking about, Canis Major. So what do we call it? So that is, we call that the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy, right? So it's an irregular galaxy, doesn't really quite have a defined shape. Um, it's a little too small for that. So just to kind of put into perspective the size difference here, um, the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy is about a million times more massive than our sun, right? The Milky Way Galaxy, in, in contrast, is about 900 billion times the size or the mass of our sun. And so we're talking about a very small galaxy relative to ours. And because of that, because of that difference, our galaxy is actually slowly consuming the uh, Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy. And that's what you see when you look at those rings called the uh, Monoceros rings. Um, I think I said that wrong, but it's fine. But- uh, Monoceros. Monoceros. I don't know. I, I say monoceros sometimes, kind of like rhinoceros. Yeah. We're going to talk about what that is at the end of the program um, because we're actually going to be exploring that all next week. But uh, but yeah, it creates this what monoceros ring. Yep. 
which wraps around our own galaxy three times. And that's that's what you see in that, that uh, artist's rendition is the Milky Way is just stripping, you know, gas, stars, dust as the uh, Anus Major Dwarf revolves around our, uh, our galaxy. Um, and it's one of two actual active minor, we call them minor merges, one of two active minor merges occurring. The other one is with the Sagittarius Dwarf, which we actually saw in that last. Yeah. All right, so back to our sky view. We have Canis Major here, where some of that's going on. Um, we have our Milky Way, the band of light going above Canis Major here, above Orion the Hunter, and Taurus the Bull across our night sky. And that is the plane of our galaxy. When you're looking in this area, you're looking straight into the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, which is, again, what uh, we think, anyway, a barred spiral. All right, so what's the brightest star in the night sky? Sirius, right? We can use Orion the Hunter's belt, go down with an imaginary line to get us to Sirius. And Sirius helps make up this winter hexagon in the stars, made up of these bright stars here. So we have Sirius here. Does anyone know what this star is right here in Orion the Hunter? I want to say the... Rigel, but I don't know if that's No, right. you're, you got it. Rigel. Yep. Rigel. And then this star in Taurus the Bull. What's that? Do you know? Aldebaran. 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 You cut out a little bit, Caleb, um, but I think that you got it. Oh. And then up here, there's the bright star in Auriga, which is what? Capella. Capella. All right. Then um, over here, we have Castor. And then this one right here is what? Pollux. Pollux. And then down to our next object that we're exploring tonight, um, that's a part of this little constellation here, Canis Minor, the little dog, is Procyon. And now we're gonna explore Procyon in more detail. Uh, Melanie's gonna help us explore that one. So Procyon is the eighth brightest star in the night sky. So it's kind of cool that within these two constellations, we have some pretty significantly bright stars and hopefully that makes it a little easier for you to find them. But surprise, surprise, we have another binary star system. And it's actually extremely similar to the Sirius A and B. And of course we call this Procyon A and B, where Procyon A is the bigger star. It's another main sequence, kind of whitish yellow, similar to the sun. And the little star, the little pup star in the little dog is uh, Procyon B. It's a white dwarf, so it is a tiny little, tiny little star. And these, again, we're fast forwarding, but if we weren't, it would take about 40 years for these two stars to go around each other. Um, and again, it's about one and a half times as massive as the sun, so pretty similar in size uh, in terms of mass. It's about two times the radius. It's a little bigger, but it's not nearly as bright as Sirius as we can see in the night sky here. Cool. Yeah, we were speeding up time 10 years every second in that simulation as well. All right, well, what else is in these two areas of the sky? So again, we have our two constellations here. Um, we like to sometimes talk about exoplanets, planets going around other stars in our um, galaxy. And we have one called GJ273. What's going on here, Caleb? So this is a very interesting uh, exoplanet because it's actually very similar to our own planet of Earth. It's actually, um, it's actually what um, astronomers call a super Earth. Um, a, a, planetary, a planet that's basically a lot bigger, more massive. So, um, before we know about it, we know it's about almost three times the mass of our own Earth. And it's actually uh, closer to its own star than Mercury is to, to our sun. So. All right, so we got four planets here. So we have one, two, three, four. I think two of them are confirmed. I think these are the two confirmed ones. And then there's candidates. So they think that there's more, but we know for sure there's two. 
And they go around this star here that's red in this depiction because it's a red dwarf star. It's smaller than our sun, it's less hot, um, and therefore the habitable zone is closer in than what our habitable zone, the area where liquid water can exist, is around our sun. And that is depicted here by this green bar. All right, so liquid water can exist here around the star. And there is GJ273b, a super Earth, rocky planet larger than our own Earth that is in the habitable zone. So we think that there might be life or really that it might be able to support life on its surface. Uh, before we talk more about that, we um, have these other little things in this depiction here. And those are what, just asteroids, right, Caleb? Yeah, yeah, that's what we. Yeah, that's what we believe. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the system, um, the light that we get from the star that tells us there's planets around it, because that's how astronomers figure out that there's planets around other stars. They look at the star light, and based on the light and how it behaves, we can infer that there are planets around it through various means. Um, but based on that information we're getting from that star, it looks like there's other objects that are small blocking the light, maybe and um, maybe those are asteroids, like how we have the asteroids in our solar system in between Mars and Jupiter. All right, well, um, didn't you find something really interesting, Caleb, that they sent like a message yes, to this? I did, yes. Uh, I found, I found um, that actually in 2017, um, scientists actually sent a message to um, GJ273b, you know, in a possible attempt to search for extraterrestrial life. Yeah. Uh, the message actually was encoded with, I think, music and a little bit of math. So, so they had know, to be smart if, <laughs> to figure yeah. out what it was, kind of, yeah. Or they knew so, that we were smart. I think that's the point. Yeah. They wanted to Well, if there is a possible, a possible response, we'll know, it, we'll, we'll know in about 25 years because the, the, the exoplanet is about 12 light years from our own sun, from our own planet. So. Yeah, so 12 light years, that means that if we send a radio signal, which is light, it's going to take about 12 years to get to this um, system here. And then if they get it and respond right away, it's going to take another 12 years. So it'll take about 25 years for us to hear back. Do you think we'll hear, do you think we'll hear back? I hope so. <laughs> That would be cool. I don't know. I feel like people would really kind of freak out, maybe. I love to think how cool it would be, but also like very shocking at the same time. But I still hope there there is. Yes. I mean, it's not like anything will happen immediately, you know, when, you know. Yeah. Um. I'll just hop in my spaceship and go <laughs> visit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it'll be it'll be War of the Worlds, you know. The book will come to life. Uh, speaking of War of the Worlds, we're gonna talk about this object here next. What is this guy? Looks red. It's not a star. It's a planet. What Mars. object is this? What'd you say, Mel? Mars. We have Mars in the sky, and Mars is right by this little tiny cluster of stars. It looks like probably a tiny little smudge on your screens. Um, but this is a star cluster of over a thousand stars out in space. It's called the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, because it really just looks like six or seven bright stars from our location on Earth, without optical aid, just with our eyes. But that is a really cool pairing in the sky. You might have seen some pictures taken from people. Um, the recent astronomy picture of the day was uh, of this, this pairing of Mars, the red planet, and Pleiades. Uh, so if you haven't seen the astronomy picture of the day, crew and friends watching, check it out because that was pretty cool. It came out yesterday. Um, and of course, it's astronomy picture of the day, so it's always changing. But you can go back to yesterday's and see. All right, how do you find Mars in the sky? Well, we just use Orion's belt and connect that with an those three stars with an imaginary line and go up away from the ground and it'll lead you to Mars and the Pleiades star cluster. 
It'll always lead you to the Pleiades, but Mars, since it's orbiting around the sun, and since Earth is also orbiting around the sun, as planets do, it's going to drift across the sky or appear to change its position in the sky based on where we are in our orbit and where Mars is in its orbit. But we can always explore Mars because we have rovers on the surface and we have orbiters going around Mars. Uh, rovers like the Perseverance rover that just landed a couple weeks ago on the red planet. And this is real footage of that event that, that, uh, that the team, excuse me, released after the landing. So I'll let this just kind of play here. Try to minimize our video so we're not blocking the screens too much. But everything you see here is real footage of the Perseverance rover landing. That was a parachute to help it slow itself down as it's orbiting Mars's atmosphere. Mars has an atmosphere that's about a hundred times thinner than our own, but it's still enough of, you know, air that creates this resistance and it can use that parachute to slow itself down. That object that's falling down to the red planet that we see here below is the heat shield to protect it from the heat that's created by its impact with the atmosphere. Oh, right. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, how thick would the, how thick does the pressure have to be just this hundred times thinner um, atmosphere than Earth's to uh, to make sure that they land safely? We know. Well, um, I mean, it's going to have to have the right parachute to be able to slow itself down. So the parachute is designed in a special um, laboratory, kind of a a vacuum type room um, where they make the pressure in the room the same as what is on Mars. And really they just designed the parachute for that. I'm not sure how thin an atmosphere can be though for a parachute to work at all. Um, they'd have to use another mechanism to really slow it down, the object down. Um, but we, we send things to the moon. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere and it still gets slowed, slowed down um, based on the thrusters and all of the engineering of the spacecraft. So you can see the stages here um, down at the bottom. This one right here is called the Sky Crane. So it's kind of like a little hovercraft that's taking it closer to the surface. Again, this is all real, real footage. Crazy, you're seeing literally the, the surface of another planet. It's amazing yeah, resolution amazing. too. Yeah. It's hard to because tell this scale looks like too. It would be a, like a simulation, but it's not. Yeah. That's the crazy part. Like I don't know about you, but like it was hard to tell like whether or not we we're actually kind of near the bottom here. Um yeah. over on the left here, let me get our cameras out of the way. Our video out of the way. There's a sky crane looking up at it, and here's the rover Perseverance looking down, and it's landing here on the red planet. Now the sky crane flies away so that it crashes at a safe distance away from the planet, or away from the uh, rover, excuse me. And this this team puts in years and years of work um, to make this all happen. So of course they're is, uh, really, really excited about it landing safely. It's always my favorite part. Yeah. I it's never, like, so like I, I kind of thought they were, I was like, why are they so happy? Like, it's just like a rover landing on a planet. And I watched this documentary where it talked about every single little thing that went into it and all the years and all the planning. And at the end, when they celebrated, I was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> when you think about it, they have, they have very little room for error. I mean, if, you know, I mean, if they did one thing wrong, it, it could end very badly, so. Um, so some responses in the chat, uh, someone said that they hope we get a response from that exoplanet system that you talked about, Caleb. 
And then Wayne, hi Wayne, um, says that there's an incredible hidden message in the parachute that landed Perseverance on Mars. And we were talking about that before we signed on today. Um, Greg, do you want to explain what that message is? Yeah, so um, the message was coded in that, that color. Um, so the, the alternating the red and white, um, red and white color scheme. And uh, I don't want to get the wording wrong, so so I'll let I'll let you say it. But uh, <laughs> but somebody actually went through and, and through binary code figured out what that message was. Yeah, um, I didn't want to get it wrong either, which is why I wanted you to say it. But uh, I think it's dare mighty things. Dare yeah, that's what, mighty things. That's what I thought things. it was too. But again, I, I didn't want to get it wrong. So. Yeah, <laughs> dare mighty things. Because yeah. I was like, is it dare? you know, might, mightly or like, oh, but it's dare mighty things. The syntax is always what yes. gets me. Yes. But there's this amazing message um, in binary code. Uh, check it out. They're selling like umbrellas with that um, yep. pattern on it <laughs> and like hoodies and stuff and dresses. So people are going all out with That's it. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're going to end today um, as we usually do with some mythology. Uh, again, we're looking at the Winter Hexagon here with Orion the Hunter and all the nearby constellations, including the two that we're focusing on tonight, Canis Major, right here, by another constellation, the bunny, Lepus. But we're not <laughs> going to talk about Lepus tonight. We're talking about Canis Major here. And we're going to also talk about some mythology um, related to Canis Minor which I'll bring up here just so that we can have both on the screen while Caleb walks us through it. And yeah, so um, here we go. Uh, what's interesting about the myth that I found for this, these two constellations is that uh, um, Canis Major was a dog named Lelaps, which was destined to basically catch whatever hunted. And the funny thing is that Canis Minor was not a dog, but actually a fox, which was destined to always escape whatever was hunting it. So basically the dog was, was sent after the fox and basically it was an endless cycle, hunting and hunter. And basically the god Zeus um, tried to end the cycle by turning them to stone and putting them into stars. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And then also um, two stars in these two organizations, Procyon and Sirius, uh, are actually first represent the, uh, the dogs of the hunter Orion. So. So despite what some people think, the star Sirius is not named after Harry Potter, unfortunately. Yeah, it's other they way around, Harry right? Potter. Yeah, so, well, it's actually, I found something actually very interesting um, about, about Sirius and its mythology, actually. Um, so I found, I found that uh, during the summer, um, during the hottest days of summer, Sirius actually rises and sets with the sun. So because of that, you know, the Greeks started basically calling those days the days of the dog, which is where we get the phrase, the dog days of summer. So that's actually pretty cool. Nice. Okay, but you mentioned Harry Potter, so we have to go back to that. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, you know, you'll find if you look around that a lot of characters in Harry Potter are named after famous Greek and Roman myths. Uh, Luke, the character Lupin is named after uh, the, is, is named after one of the founders of Rome, who was supposedly raised by a wolf. And then uh, the character McGonagall, her first name Minerva, is actually the name of the Roman goddess, uh, Roman form of uh, Athena, goddess of uh, wisdom and battle strategy. Hmm. So, and then there's a, a lot of star names too, which there's some overlap. Um, so there's Bellatrix, yeah, which is in Orion the Hunter. Um, and there's constellations too, like Draco the Dragon, and there's Draco Malfoy. But there's also yeah. Sirius here, like Sirius Black. And what did Sirius Black turn into in the book? Sorry, this is a spoiler for those who don't know, but it's Harry Potter, you should know by now. Um, been long enough. Yeah. <laughs> so what did Sirius turn into? I'm gonna take a wild guess and say a dog. A dog, yep. Yeah, and what do you know? Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, is a part of the dog constellation, Canis Major. Not because of Harry Potter, other way around. 
The book was inspired by some star names and, uh, as Caleb, men Caleb mentioned, some mythology as well. So, Canis Minor technically won, right? Out of the competition that, that he had with Canis Major, because he never got I caught. Think we didn't right? get caught, yeah. Yeah, part of, yeah, part of it is it's called because it always rises before um, Canis Major, actually. So, so, so it's like always rising yeah, the hunted is rising before the hunter, so. All right, we're going to end with this majestic unicorn here. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, it's like one of my favorite things in the sky because it's in between Canis Minor, the little dog, and Canis Major, which is down here. Right in between the two. There's basically no stars there, but there's a whole other constellation, the unicorn. It's um, spelled as you see here, Monoceros. Monoceros. Like Kayla, or excuse me, Greg was mentioning earlier, there's the Monoceros ring, right? Of mm -hmm. the that was created by the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy, going around and having um, you know, the gravity of our large Milky Way galaxy kind of stripping off stars and leaving these trails behind it. Um, so we're going to talk more about this constellation, Monoceros, next week. So join us then. But for now, any final thoughts, crew? We good? Yep. All right. Well, we're going to be back next week. So thanks so much for watching, everyone. Have a great weekend and stay safe. See you next week.